me get my stuff together here. If you're visiting with us, uh, my name is Patrick Jones. Uh, my lovely wife, Ruth, is uh, sitting in the corner there. Uh, we celebrate our 26th year anniversary this year. Uh, it, it's, it's funny, uh, June 21st of this year, I've been disciple for, thank you, I need this note here. <laughs> June 21st of this month, I'll be celebrating 32 years in the kingdom. I was converted when I was 18, so that's a long time in the kingdom. And I have seen a lot in the kingdom of God. But I'm very grateful and thankful. I'm going to apologize right up front. Because I'm apologize. I'm most likely going to offend some of you today. I might hurt you a little bit. But I got to leave here and go to Stafford. So you won't be able to talk to me after the service. Because you can see Matt. That's my over there. I'm going to that. Oh, man. Will Archer uh, is over in Indonesia, uh, there with the team. Uh, this is the first year that Ruth and I couldn't make it, so I thought I'd represent Indonesia today. Uh, I worked on my deal. Uh, it's been uh, great uh, just to stay in contact with the individuals of Indonesia. If you're visiting with us, we normally do a trip every year to have people go over to serve, and this is an incredible, amazing group over there. I don't know where you are this morning, but I had the honor to, uh, the, uh, on Friday to go to the front of Eve. Um, I'm a Games. I went blank there. And when you go to the site of Spirit, it's amazing to hear those words there in a better place. And then hear the stories after stories about how she had an impact on the world. A full house. And she had a family come in like right hours before a major surgery. And the doctor said, it's not, not looking good. We don't know. But the last few hours, the kids spent time with them and gave them cards and she said, you know what? I'm not ready. But God calls me home, I'm ready to go. I don't know where you are this morning, but can you say that in peace? If God calls you right now and take you away, are you ready? No, we're going to preach on, you know, Jesus and his submission to the will of God. And after going to the funeral, I said, you know what? I, was this, I walked this morning, and I heard our worship service, and it was not pleasing. We're flat this morning. I'm on the outside. We're flat. If that's your best you gave this morning, I'm calling you to repent. And I'm just going to shoot scripture this morning. I'm going to go to a scripture. I'm not going to be able to read all the scripture I have on this seven page sheet here. So I'm going to roll through them the best I can. Um, and it's just. Uh, just work with me, be with me while I go through this, okay? Okay. Jesus had a tremendous relationship with God. We know the story of what Jesus, we know he connected with his father. We knew in John chapter 1 that the word was the flesh, that you know, Jesus knew what he had to do for us. It was obvious, we know that. The word became flesh. In Mark 1, Chris, thank you, Chris and uh, Michael, for your community and your contribution. Right down the line where I'm going today. Right on point. Jesus got early in the morning to spend time with Jesus. Why? Because he, he loved him. He wanted to be with him. That's where he got strength. Mark 26, it shows how he went connected with him when he went to the, the garden. But before I go a little bit more deeper with my message and my title, let's go to God in prayer. God, you're awesome. Remove me and let your spirit speak. Help me to say the words that you want me to say. If it's not on the paper, God, remove those words and give me clearly that your spirit guide me down the road that you want me to go. God, I don't know where everyone is in this room today, but I do know this. If you came back today and you called me to speak, you want me to make them think about, are they ready if you came back today? God, I pray that each person in this room, what situation they're in, God, that you build them, you open their eyes, and that they can see what you have planned for them. Thank you for this time to speak. Bless us in your name. Amen. Jesus was amazing. In Mark chapter 14, starting verse 32, this is where the text of my scripture is going to come from. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we notice where Jesus connected with his father. Where he begged for his father. He didn't want to go, but he knew it was time to go, just a few hours. Starting in verse 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus says to the disciple, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, John, along with them, and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. 
My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said. Stay here, keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it's possible, the hour might pass for me. I, my father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. One more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say. Returned the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and rested? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered in the hands of the sinner. Jesus knew this time was about to come. If you want to give my message a title today, that last part of that verse, it says, enough, the hour has come. If you had one hour to live today, what would it be like? One hour. What could you change in one hour? If you knew you was given one hour, it could be from a doctor, a physician, one hour, what would you try to accomplish? Jesus came in the third time. His, his, his disciples are sleeping. He's right around each of the most one hour. You know, I've read this passage numerous of times, but I didn't realize how much it emphasized on the hour. The hour. Now, I know history and the scholars say, you know, he mentioned, you know, coming up to that time, but just think about it. One hour. He's with them. And he's trying to plead with them. Hey, you got one hour with me. What is it going to be like? Are you going to cherish this time? What is it going to be like if you had one hour with your family today? When you walk out this door, the person you pass, you got one hour to change the world. What would it be like? If you had one hour to get your life together, what would it be like? It was like you're saying this morning, you're in trouble. One hour. The time I messed enough. The hour has come. Jesus knew his time had to be fulfilled. He knew he had to die for us. But do you realize what he died for? You know, life is, after hearing all the sharing at the uh, funeral, it's very humbling because I thought there, I sit there, I said, God took me away today. What would be left behind for me? What would people say about me? Would they have good things to say? Encouraging things to say? What mark will I leave behind? Even though so many great marks are mine, child to child, verse after verse, people after people whose mind they're sharing, all great things, the impact you had, to see this ministry all across the community, involved, serving. Now I'm just, I'm just sitting like, wow. What would they say about me? What would they say about you? James 4 says that, you know, our life is like a mist. It's here today. We're going tomorrow. My first Bible talk in college I went to, the brother did a Bible talk on that. He had a candle like this. And he said, hey, life is just like this. You did this here? See how quickly the mist go away? You can be here and you're gone. So I tried to imitate that the following week. I brought this big old can spray in. <laughs> and I'm looking around, I'm not sure, hey, hey here's a mist. And I sprayed it and sprayed myself in the eyes. <laughs> And I was there crying, I was like, okay, that wasn't the way it should be going, but it's a miss. But look at the miss. Is that your life today is over, just like that? Second mm -hmm. Peter 3 says, you know, a, a thousand years is like a day to God. A day is like a thousand years. Jesus had to fulfill the scriptures. He had to submit. You know, when we talk about submission, submission defines the act or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force. The will to authority of another person. The act to surrender. Then I look up surrender because I didn't know where to go with my message. Then I look up surrender. It's to cease resistance to an enemy or opponent. Submit to the authority. To give up. To give in. To stop fighting. Church, if you're busy here, we are a blessed church. We're blessed. We got a lot of great things going for us. We got a great marriage and family ministry, a lot of maturity. We got some fired up summit ministry people. Summit. summit. We got some amazing kids 
our middle school teens and teens, I mean, I love them. They're fired up. They, they're ready to go. We have incredible staff, evangelists, women's ministry leader, youth ministry leader. We even got church administrator. Man, we're loaded. We got a board. We got a benevolence coordinator. We got our community outreach. I mean, benevolence. I mean, we do things in community. We serve the poor. We reach out to need. We got children's ministry. We got teen interns coming in. We got single interns coming yeah. in. We got deacons in their wives. We got elders in their wives. We even got a media coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I've been here since the existence of this church. We're loaded on paper. Yeah. We're loaded as a team. But the outside, what we really look like, we look great. But what's going on in the heart? We know the heart is the seat for all things, but what's going on in the heart? We're loaded. Man, we look really good. I talked to other churches, man, they're blown away about what we do as a church. But Dash Marcus can tell you, and the Marcus, and you know, Ruth, since we've been appointed elders, we've been involved with families. It's been great to be part of those teams. We got a lot going on in a small church. There are a lot of needs out there that can be taken care of in an hour. But some are so stuck in our own world, selfish world, that we're missing that hour to take care of those people. When I thought of this truth, I thought about Revelations 2. Now, I'm not going to have to read. I can't, I can't go through all of them. But that's the one that says that, you know, hey, you do know these great things. But I hold this against you. You lost your first love. Church, we're throwing out the first love. Revelation 3, he goes and says, hey, I know your deeds. You're no longer hot anymore. You're not cold, but you're lukewarm. You're badly doing the best you can. And I thought about where are we as a church? We're right there stuck, selfish. We've gotten our first love. We keep bringing the eleven in 2003, 14 years ago. Right. 14 years ago, we're still talking about 11. How it's hurt. And the church messed me up. 14 years ago. You got to move on from that. Enough. You got to move on from that. 14 years ago, you're still talking about what you didn't do or that made me do this. You got to change that. People are dying. People are starving. People are homeless. If you had one hour, what could you change? Have two points. One, we got to surrender our will to the Lord. Two, we got to surrender to his church. Mark 14, we talked about that. We looked at Jesus' lifestyle. He said, take this cup from me. I don't want it. I don't want to do this. You know, I like to dress the whole church, but you know, I have to really break it down and go each person by each person. I wish I could do that, but due to time, I can't. So I'm going to group you all up. To you married folks. Oh, yes. 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 To you married folks. Stop all the fighting at home. You got one hour. You're wasting time fighting each other. You could be serving someone, encouraging someone, reaching out to someone, having another family over. Yeah, you're fighting each other. That's enough. The time is coming. You can reach out and you serve the poor. Get with some cups that you can hang out with. Be a light to the world. The world's hurting. People going to divorce day after day. And you're in the house fighting. Not getting along. Enough. It's time to change that. Fighting over finance. Fighting who's getting the kids. What are the kids doing? Enough. Some of you say, hey, my spouse don't get it. But you're in the cycle. What do you mean your spouse don't get it? First Timothy 4, the best way to win the moment is watch your life and doctrine closely. That's the problem. If you watch your life and doctrine closely, you probably help them move along. But you guess what? You don't. Watch your life and doctrine closely, brothers. Watch what's coming out of your mouth. How you talk to your wife. Enough. You teens. 
See you all sitting in the back row. I got you. <laughs> we got some awesome teams. Smart. Man, I love me some Alex Bravo. Just got to point him out. Straight shooter. To the point. No fluff. I wish more was like that. But our team, you got to respect your household. You got to respect what mom and dad's got on the table. You may not like it, but it's there for a reason. Serve your parents. Show them you hear them. Don't ignore them. Give them the respect. My Cone Storm ministry, they're probably not here. They're probably up in Philly. Man, I love them. And since I just graduated in the club, I really feel good about Cone Storm ministry. <laughs> I wish I had time to go into the scripture, but in Titus chapter 2, it talks about the cornerstones. The older women teaching the younger women. The older men teaching the older men. Cornerstone, we need you. These families need you. The Americans need you. You have no excuses. If you need a ride, call somebody. Our young brothers and sisters need help. They need to know how to respect each other. They need to know how to raise their kids. They need to know how to have a father-son relationship, mother-daughter relationship. They need to know how to dress modestly, to dress wise. Come on, they need help. They need to know how to be self-controlled, how to control their tongues. They need to know how not to gossip and stand with people, not to be judgmental. Control, they need to know how to control their emotions. Some of your sisters are often chained with your emotions. Some of them need you. And we got some brothers too who are off the chain with their emotions. <laughs> we need some help the sisters stand in their lane. Sisters, your husband's got to lead, allow them to lead in your household, in your church. We need some help with these women becoming proper 31 women. Where are they? You got no excuses. Miss Ann's not here, but I love her. She came to church one a few years ago. She don't mind me sharing this. She had lost her teeth. And she's a pastor, I can't find my teeth. <laughs> we tend to our turn looking for a teeth. Because <laughs> she couldn't fail, she couldn't talk. All right, Miss Ann, I'm, I'm looking all over for a teeth. But she wanted to talk. Found out her teeth was in the car. <laughs> but call us on no excuses. If you need teeth, go get them. <laughs> you need a hearing aid, go get one. You need glasses, go get them. Get in these families' homes. Have someone invite you over. Let them get a taste of your cooking, these young sisters. Show them how to manage their finances. Campus, no excuses. I don't want to hear about we we'll have a real campus in Woodbridge. Why not have the best community college in the nation for God? No. You want to talk about some big campus. You got a community campus, college. Make it happen. No, what do you mean not real college campus? Campuses, you're around students every single day. Walking by you. Slowly dying away. But you own your own little mission school and classes. Singles. You're surrounded by thousands. No excuse. Take your eye on Billy. Brothers, guys, take your eye on Sue. Get focused on the mission. The person you got your eye on may not be the one for you. God may have the person lined up for you, waiting for you to reach out to him. It's okay to convert your spouse. It's okay. But sometimes we get so stuck in the relationship that we can't get our focus on the right thing. What if you had one hour to get that right? What would it be like? Move-ins. I know we got a few move-ins. It's great to have David and Rashida with us in Dallas. I don't know what you heard about the church. And you're moving in. But you got fresh eyes. You see something, say something. I don't know what you heard. I don't know what you expect. But you're not going to just roll up in here and lay low. We're going to call you to be a disciple just like everybody else. Sometimes we like to hip hop around and find a good comfort spot. 
I know it's not that harsh, but hey, when you move in here, you can be called to the same standard as the early church. Amen. Don't get comfortable. Move in. The thing I learned about when you move, if you're moving around, you've got to be the aggressor. When Ruth and I moved in 2001, we took a year to get connected. Because we're sitting back waiting for someone to reach out to us. I talked about the summit. You gotta be doing it enough. There's so much to do. My second point, I'm sorry, I can't go. My second point is so written to his church. If Matthew chapter 16, just put this down. Peter was approached by Jesus. Thank you. Give me a bit more time. Peter was approached by Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, who, who, who do the people say I am around here? And, you know, uh, Peter said, hey, some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah. Then Jesus looked at him and said, I said, hey, how about you? What did you say? He said, he went on to say, hey, you are a living God. He said, that wasn't revealed to you by man, but God. Because you're Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to my church. And then we know later on in Acts, Peter stood up and addressed the crowd. Thousands became Christian, very diverse. Peter went on and, and the people in the crowd said, hey, what should we do? I don't know what time it was, but it was an hour. A lot of people got converted. We got us a rhythm to God church. I've been very fortunate to be here. I know probably Matt and the Xbox have also. We've probably been to every leader that's been through the Potomac Valley. They all had different styles. They all had different things to work on. There were maids. I knew Karen and her parents was our leaders in campus ministry, just like a father to us. Ryan and May and I had a lot of years together. The Fatis. His youngest son's getting baptized today. They're very close to us. Amen. But we had a lot of tears together over this church. The maids, Mike May, Joe the May, a lot of time together, a lot of tears. The grubs, a lot of tears, a lot of together. We went through a lot together. Now we have the archers. The amazing couple. And they're awesome. Will's probably one of the most vulnerable men I've seen when he comes here. Sometimes I get frustrated with him, like, you know, he apologizing too much for the gospel. He's always apologizing. I appreciate your heart, but sometimes you gotta lay it out and you gotta move on. We don't know what we have in the archers. They're very special. They're very dear. But some of us don't want to get on board with them. Their mission is very clear. It's all on back our shirts. Gather, serve, multiply. Very simple. Just like the early church. They come together, they serve together, and they multiply. Some of us put our heels in the ground because we don't want to do that. Why? Because we come from the altars? Enough. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider their outcome a way of life. Imitate their faith. Hang around will is his faith. Verse 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you. I've been around a lot of ministry couples in my 13 years. Some still in the ministry. Some no longer in the ministry. Being in the ministry is a tough job. And if you're not surrounded with joy and encouraging people, it's going to encourage you and challenge you. It is tough. That's why the Bible says make your work a joy. Have you been making your work a joy? Or have you been bucking the system? The system is pretty easy. But since the letter, you know, we're throwing out all the little simple stuff. I even got buzzed in bed no more. What do you mean committed? What do you mean come to service? What do you mean what time? The early church didn't ask what time, they just asked where. Mm -hmm. They didn't worry about the location. What part of town? How are they going to get there? They showed up. Come on. Come on God. 
We're so selfish. We're looking at man. It's gonna take five minutes out of my day. I gotta drive on the other side of town. I've driven an hour and a half to church. We don't even want to drive. Enough. If you had an hour, that stuff is pity. The early church did not live like this. Due to time, I have a few questions for you as I wrap up. I got a lot of questions for you. Just something for you to think as you go. Come on, Come on, Come on, Come on Are you struggling to direct the church because it's not your plan or ideal? Are you struggling because you're not in control anymore? Are you struggling to direct because you want to be a, you want to be led, you want to be led? Well, let me change that up. You want to lead but not be led. A lot of us like to be out front, but we don't like anybody giving us advice. Do you like being around the disciples who are challenge you, or do you like the comfort zone? Do you feel only certain people can get in your life? I've heard this. Only certain people can disciple me. When was the last time you allowed your true character to get discipled? Someone to actually the person to go deep. When was the last time someone challenged your character? Some of you put your heels to the ground. You coursed every single thing, every decision. You're critical. Your heart is not here. You're not in a good place, but you coursed everything. God's in control. And I tell you, if you're being negative and critical of God church and God people, he's going to deal with you. That's my belief. That's my personal belief. You can be negative and critical, but once you pull and stray those two in a way that wants to get to know him, and you're being negative and critical, God will deal with you. You think about moving? Why? Why? Put it down on paper. Pray about it. Get some input. I appreciate Dave in the text. He prayed. Talked about it. What's going on? Doors open. Doors open. Sometimes as doors continue to close and close, you got to stop and ask yourself, why is God closing doors? He probably says you haven't got something you want you to get while you're here. Now, you can force it. I see people force the hand to, and make the move. The struggles they had, the issues they did not deal with, follow them right along to the next place, and they're right back in the same place within a year. Why are you moving? If you keep shutting doors, you got to stop and look at it. You got to stop and look. Why is he trying to show me? You stop giving financially? I appreciate Michael. You're not hurt. Hey, God don't need your money. You stop giving, he's gonna bring in more to make up for it. But he's gonna deal with you by robbing God. Malachi 3. You can stop giving. God's gonna get his money. It may not be pleasant how you give, he's gonna get his money. Think about it. When you stop giving, I remember when I couldn't give, everything was breaking down around me. <laughs> House came in. I start giving. Oh man, God has shown us favor. <laughs> I heard I heard a preacher say real quickly. He said, "Hey, you know when God shows you favor, when your car's not breaking, and you're, you're riding on barrel, you know, your house not falling apart, things are happening. You can check in the mail like, where'd that come from? And you know, things are happening, bills get paid off. But when you start robbing God, He's gonna give us money." Like Michael said, God said we should be a cheerful giver. Are you surrendering to the will of God this morning? Are you surrendering his commitment? Are you totally sold out by commitment? It's not what time will be, are you willing to be there? Are you totally sold out with your relationship? Discipleship? In your marriage, are you willing to make your work? In Mark 10, so what if God joined them at your different heart? Are you committed to that? How so? Are you willing to give that together? Enough. You gotta be committed and surrender. Maybe you're busy this morning. You're not sure where you are. You're not sure if you're close to God. You're not sure if that you're in a good place. I encourage you to give this person their advice trying to open the Bible. Yeah. We have one hour. I want to leave you all with a challenge. One hour. Think about what you can do in one hour. What impact can you have on someone's life in one hour? As I read this poem, it's one of my favorite ones. 
I'm going to close out with. You've all heard me use this before. It's called the Fellowship of the Unashamed. I'm going to read this, think about it, and then we're going to close out with a prayer. Sorry I had to rush there, but hopefully you got something. I'm a part of the Fellowship of the Unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, <coughs> sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame vision, my dame talking, chest eyes giving drop goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, a position, promotions, applause, popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by present, learn by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gait is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow. My way is rough, my companions are few, my guide reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, loaded away, turned back, diluted, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemies, pung at the food of popularity, and make an amazing leader of the I won't give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I preached up, prayed up, paid up, stood up, and stayed up to the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until all knows, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, I have no problem, he will have no problem recognizing me because my colors will be clear. If you came back in the hour, with your colors be clear. You got one hour to think about it. If you came back an hour, would your colors be clear?